and I played this this leftover dub from Michael Jackson, and they're all freaked out. You know, so it's a beautiful beat and with some horn samples. And they're like, dude, you have to put this out. You know, this is amazing. And I'm like, well, do we think so? And then we just pressed a couple of vinyl, and then it flew out, and that was basically the first version of Horny. Hey guys, my name is Musti. I'm a music producer based in Hanover, Germany. And right now here, basically, I can consider it my home, really. It's our company. It's called Peppermint Pavillon, and it consists of a beautiful recording facility, a great uh, recording room, a couple of studios, a couple of writing rooms, two record companies, actually, event company, which is uh, taking care of this building and some other buildings around the area, a beautiful restaurant, a big rehearsal room or like an event room, if you want to say so. And yeah, this is basically where we do our damage. We moved uh, here in the year 2000. We had the world's exhibition here, the Expo. And uh, our old studio was based in the city center. So the lease was up and we we're like, all right, the first monies were coming in from our first big records like Horny and Sex Pump and all that stuff. And we we're like, all right, let's be businessmen. Let's try to maybe uh, get a nice little uh, uh, place. So we um, took the former Belgian pavilion over which is really nice. And we actually had to buy that off the Belgian authority. So we spoke actually to the state of Belgium to do this. And at the beginning, we only were kind of like a, a, a little record company and this, the music studio. So this is what we started here. The rooftop bar, actually, a Be Belgian beer bar, um, was uh, meant to be a restaurant. But obviously, at the very beginning, we said like, look, guys, you know, we're, we're into music, you know, we can't do, I can drink beers, but you know, I can't, I can't do, uh, you know, like a uh, gastronomical services but uh, at one point the beautiful chef he basically contacted us and said like look i'm your man you know if, if you want to do a partnership let's do it and he's still here after 18 years so it's a beautiful setup where you can basically do business be creative but hang out you know get inspired get creative and uh, i'm a lucky guy to be here so where did it all start um Obviously, I mean, my parents were music lovers, but they, they weren't musicians or something. My dad was a doctor and uh, uh, my mom, she was uh, the biggest Tom Jones fan around. So she was listening to Tom Jones at home. My dad was listening to Turkish music since I have Turkish heritage. And at the very beginning, I didn't like both of them, like both music styles, because obviously if the parents play something, you think it's pretty uncool. And then I kind of like developed my own own sense of music and I really like rock. I like, uh, you know, ACDC, like, you know, hard rock, a bit of metal and stuff, Iron Maiden. That was my kind of music. And uh, at one point when I was 13, 14, my dad kind of uh, uh, asked if I would like to learn a music instrument, if it would be like piano or the, or the organ. So I, I chose the organ because of the multiple varieties and more knobs and all that stuff. So, you know. I was doing the two manuals with the bass pedal and stuff, and I did that for a year, but I, I I had to stop because I wasn't feeling going to school after the regular school. So I had like, you know, two schools in one day, you know, doesn't work for me or didn't work, maybe wouldn't work for any uh, teenagers. So uh, we stopped and my dad was so cool to sponsor my first synthesizer, which was a Roland 3JX3P, three, three, uh, J, J, beautiful uh, uh, synthesizer. I'll still have it. I'll show you guys later. And uh, there where it all started, basically. I was basically in a, in a, in a little room at home and like doing, doing music like via overtop, overdub techniques. So having a tape recorder, playing music from that uh, uh, facility, playing to it and recording with another tape recorder. So you would s slowly have like a, 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 a multi-track recording, if you want to say so, you know, which uh, at the end was very noisy, obviously, you know. But uh, that's how it all started. And then um, at one point I got into like collecting records, you know, finishing school, um, starting my studies. So I, I went a bit for economics at one point, you know, which I knew wasn't really my thing, but I still started it because my dad would uh, like that uh, to, um, to be. And um, then at one point, basically uh, just out of pure money reasons, you know, I started DJing. So that was really cool, you know, but I was playing in bands before that because of my like, keyboard activities and then you know the whole dj scene kind of happened and then uh it opened up a brand new world for me so you know then slowly you know doing more and more gigs you know slowly starting in uh, producing music writing music you know which uh at this uh, early age you don't know that you actually write a song when you do so you know you just do music and you go like hey it sounds great but you actually have written a song you know which is beautiful 
So uh, basically, um, I was being a DJ and already like uh, uh, being a producer, if you want to say so, you know. Um, I did more and more productions and, you know, that was all pre-internet time. So whatever we did was like released on vinyl and then it took a couple of months to go around the globe and get a little hype and then maybe the hype would, would eventually come back to Germany. And um, then I, I kind of like um, discovered remixing for me, uh, which was a beautiful field because you, you can actually work with really big artists or big names and actually be re very creative with with their with their original music so you know i was doing a lot of remixing for for german major companies and at one point you know international major companies was uh, coming coming into the game and so i was doing that and at one point um i had a beautiful uh, beautiful weekend it was basically i was remixing michael jackson ghosts a uh, beautiful track of his um simply read i think a project from germany called mr president coco jumbo very very cheesy track but I, I think my version kind of like was nice and something else and because of these tracks um a year or two yeah one year later i got a grammy nomination which was like the beginning of 98 and at the same time actually because no let me go back because this michael jackson mix i was working on I did a dub mix like really late in the morning, you know, I did like several mixes and this dub mix basically was really cool, but I was like, look, maybe they don't really need it for the whole package. I delivered so many mixes. I kind of put it back in the in the, in the the bin basically. And then a couple of months later, I had a good DJ friend of mine, Roger Sanchez from New York. Uh, he came by, so we listened to music. I played him some stuff and my partner was sitting there and I played this this uh, this leftover dub from Michael Jackson and they all freaked out. You know, it was a beautiful beat and with some horn samples. And they're like, dude, you have to put this out. You know, this is amazing. And I'm like, oh, do we think so? And then we just pressed a couple of vinyl and then it flew out. And that was basically the first version of Horny, my first big hit. Uh, that was in 97. And because it was already, you know, getting so much hype, I was like, hang on, this is an instrumental and people liking that already. Let me try to do a song over it. So I did that. And then basically um, 98 was an amazing year. So basically Horny blew up my first hit. And I got the Grammy nomination the same year. So it was like, wow, you know, bang, you know, something happened there. So that kind of like opened my whole uh, st spectrum, like uh, how, how I would see the industry and, you know, coming from underground, you know, from the cool guys, from the DJs and uh, this whole pop pop circuit kind of opened up to me. Great little situation. You have your first uh, uh, worldwide hit with Horny. It was really great. And a little, little fun fact, it actually was signed by Rick Rubin for um, American Records in America. Because he had the he had the hookup as well with his partner George Shakulius. He had the hookup for South Park, and they used the track in the movie and uh, on the compilation, which did like 25 million copies, I think, back then. You know, it was really a lot. But I never got any radio in America because of the lyric "horny." So they just got played in Miami or New York or maybe LA or something. So it was really cool. But anyway, having having a big record basically requires a second big record or like a follow up or something like an album. So I was basically working on an album. And then the back then distribution, they said like, all right, why don't you deliver like 12 hornies? And then we're happy. I'm like, dude, you know, that's not so easy. You know, you just do a great record, but you know, I'm not sure if I could do that. I tried it and I was really ashamed of myself, almost like embarrassed. I said, look, you can't like copy yourself. So, you know, I just like, you know, uh, wrote more songs. And then uh, we had this idea because we met, we met the, uh, the manager of Tom Jones, his son, Mark Woodward. And he really liked what I was doing. So he said, like, look, let's work together at one point. So we had this contact and then we w wrote this song, you know, uh, um, because we were writing it kind of, he said, like, you know, why don't we do something for Tom Jones? We love his voice. So we're like, all right, you know, let's try that. And then my partner, you know, we were writing the song together and he had like, this idea is like, Tom Jones for me is a sex symbol. You know, he still get this knicker thrown in him at, on the stage and all that stuff. So let's call the so so song sex symbol. I'm like, you know, I came up with this blues riff and then, I was like, sex symbol doesn't really feel good. What about sex bomb? And then we just did it. Um, Emma, the singer who sang um, Horny, she demoed the, the, the track. So I sent it to Tom Jones. He was like, he called right back, said like, wow, let's do this real fast. Because basically I just did a, did a, did a, did a album. It's called Reloaded with, a, with a, a Robbie Williams, all those guys. And basically the album is closed now. So I'm going to try to get the song on it. And then uh, I flew to London. We recorded the song. It was basically a, a one take, one taker. You know, we just, we just, uh, you know, I think he just did the sound check, and then he just did one take. Um, and the next thing I know, it's a, it's a huge hit. So it's like uh, another one there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 